It's part three on the race skedaddler. Let's take a look at the engine, the clutching, and of course, we'll get that drive line together. You guys have all been waiting for that. All right, here's the engines. So this is the motor that's coming out. This is a JLO L295. It makes about 19 horsepower with an HD carb, but I had an HR on it because whatever. I was going to run it in some class that I never did, and then it was just on, and it worked, and I left it. Uh, so not great on power. And the poor sled probably couldn't break 40 miles an hour with that motor. Part of it was probably the clutching, too. Uh, she really didn't spin too fast. Here is the R295 and uh, the R295 is reputed to put out at least 24 horsepower with an HD carb maybe more there's some guys out there that claim 26 I can find no documentation to back that up but I can find documentation to back up 24 so we're going with that um, otherwise we've got like clutching here and I got a pile of carbs let me grab you off that tripod and get you in for a closer view all right, well, let's start with the differences between these motors. And the, the most obvious one, the old L295's got the big 18 millimeter spark plug right in the middle of the head pointing straight up. And the R has a 14 millimeter plug. Uh, in fact, I think a BR90S works. Um, angled on the head, you can see where the L cutout would be. There is no cutout there, it's moved. So, um, there's a there's your basic br9 solid core so that's the obvious difference when you're walking up to one of these to tell it apart another way to tell that it isn't just on an r head on an l is these screws right here so you can see the l completely lacks those screws so there's some kind of a baffle in here for the cooling and then the fan on this, I'd have to take it apart to show you, but it's got a different fan. It's got a lighter flywheel, and there's no provision for electric start, except for it looks like there is. I think when they say that, what they're saying is there's no ring gear on the flywheel to give it a, a lighter flywheel. Um, I've been told there's porting differences. I've been told that head gives it higher compression. Yeah, I'd buy all that. I mean, we're talking five horsepower and an extra five horsepower out of a 300cc one lunger. That's a lot. They probably threw everything they had in it, especially when you consider it's five horsepower without a tune pipe. So uh, that kind of wraps up the motor. I need to swap it over onto these mounts. Uh, I might swap the recoils around. Uh, this recoil has been pretty good to me. Um, if you're getting into these old JLOs, the recoil is the weak point. Uh, the recoil tends to stick when it gets cold. Uh, they have a lot of trouble carry a spare all right so that's all fine and dandy on the clutching so the old motor i ran a regular duster on it i'm gonna run the ribbed for her pleasure comet duster on this thing uh, i don't know how i'm gonna calibrate it yet and I'll, I'll probably take just a general stab at clutch calibration and i won't get it dialed in until we're on the snow so we've got that going for us then we've got the carb pile I've got a whole bunch of HD carbs, and they're all a little different, and uh, I don't even know what carb necessarily came off of this motor. Um, they're probably all pretty good, pretty fixable. I think I decided to go with this carb uh, just because I like the uh, I like the little pickup point here for the cable and this cable bracket. Uh, I think those are both probably going to serve me pretty well. So I think this is the carb. And um, I think I'm going to take off this kitchen strainer looking device here and swap it over to the carb I'm going to use. Obviously, I got to clean the carbs. So I got a bunch of stuff to do on this thing, and I'm just going to get after it. Oh, yeah, there'll be an exhaust mod too. Uh, not an illegal exhaust mod, just a for durability exhaust mod. Um, I got some parts on order when they come in, I'll show you that. So stick around, that should be, you know, about the end of this video. 
All right, let's start by getting this old duster off of there. Clutch bolt. It's just a normal hardware store bolt. It's a fine thread, half inch bolt. Uh, as far as the puller goes, this is like an Articat hex clutch puller, I believe. It's a 9 16 18, uh, so uh, 9 16 fine thread, and uh, it just threads in. There we go. A little bit of a pop, but she came right off. Not bad. All right, let me switch things around and we'll get set up to pull the motor off the motor plate. All right, here goes the motor plate. Um, very Polaris like 7 16 bolts there. There we go. Well, let's not drop a carb on the floor. Alright, so there we go. Where'd that washer go that fell? There it is. So, I kind of want to show you this motor plate. This thing is like super flexible as far as alignment goes. Um, I can really easily shift the motor any old way. So, that's pretty cool. Uh, it was on this way, so we'll put it back on that way. And, uh, like I said, these are all carriage bolts here. So, later on when I want to align my clutches, I just loosen it up and slide it over. All right, let's get this motor plate back on. So there is a torque for these bolts, I believe, being that the, this is just like Polaris, 7 16 bolts into an aluminum casting, I believe it's going to be 50 foot-pounds. At least that's what my first torque will be. All right, got the motor laid down just to make it a little easier to handle. That's set at 50. Yeah, 50. There we go. Let's try to give you a little look at that service tag on the motor. I may have to take a picture of it with my camera. But uh, yes, indeed, it is an R295. And that's where the big old HD carb goes. This is the pulse port. Uh, Another thing I forgot to mention about this motor, I have changed the crank seals on it and I have set the timing correctly with the dial indicator. I did all that stuff years ago and this thing's just been sitting waiting to go into the skedaddler. So I am pretty excited to get it in now, finally, after it's been sitting around all these years. So one thing I like about my old motor setup was where I put the tether switch, right to the motor, bolted solid. It's a great place for it. I mean, you can put one on your handlebars, but if you hit a tree, you might break your handlebars off, rip the switch off, and the sled might keep going. I don't think you're going to break your motor off very easily. All right, let's get this tether back on there. Um, I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to get too fancy with this. I know the right way to do it is to pull the whole motor apart, and pull the cases, and clean everything when you're done. Look, it's just aluminum. It's not going to stick to the magnets on the flywheel. It's not, it's not going to give me any big problems. So we'll just get this thing mounted. I mean, I got the spark plug in. It'll at least give me credit for that. Let's see, here's my quarter 20 tap.
you know, there's one thing I am going to do before I bolt this down and finish it up. I just thought about this. It's a pretty damp environment sometimes when you're snowmobiling. I'm going to cover up those terminals with something. Maybe I'll just pinch a piece of rubber in there or something. I'll go figure it out quick. I'll be right back. All right, so here's what we're doing to protect those terminals. Shoe goo. Now, I don't use shoe goo on engines, but uh, boy, I've had good luck with it on a lot of other things. So, uh, I mean, this is way tougher. This is way more durable than RTV. So, we'll just... Uh, We'll just cover up the back of that. I'll go get rid of this excess shoe goo on there real quick. All right, and then I don't want the shoe goo sticking to the motor, so we'll just do a little square of a random piece of old rubber I had laying around. That should be adequate. That should keep the thing from shorting out. All right, well, let's chuck this thing back in there. Line up that rubber piece. And look carefully. The shoehorn. Plop, there we go. She's in. I like it. All right, I got the motor mounted up. Let me show you. So uh, I've got my bolts in there. And uh, the key thing I want to show you is up here at this corner. Well, that corner gave me trouble in the past. I don't know if it was because the belt was failing or what. But the belt had rubbed on that bolt. So I put in a lower rubber isolator and I trimmed a big chunk off, as you can see there. So that should be totally clear of any issues from now on. All right. Well, I popped the rib for her pleasure Comet Duster on there. And uh, as you can see, looks like it's lined up pretty good. My homemade belt alignment tool is literally just a piece of steel the same width as the belt. And there's not much to do other than eyeball it. And it looks pretty darn good, which is uh, actually not surprising because the bottom end of the two motors is exactly the same. So uh, I think they even share the same crank part number. So I'm going to go with that. Should be fine. All right, let's talk Comet Dusters for a second. Adjust that up a little bit. So how do you get a duster apart, right? I mean, nothing. Well, if you read the manual, what you're actually supposed to do is thread a 9 16 bolt in. That's, you know, the same threads as that puller I used. You don't thread it all the way in. You leave yourself a gap. But uh, you thread your 9 16 bolt in, hold like so, and... Nope, well, looks like i got to back that out a little bit. But as you can see, that'll do it. Can you see that? Maybe not. As you can see there, that'll do it. She's apart. All right, so we got an orange spring. I don't know what that means. I got to get out my Comet Duster spring chart, puck chart, calibration chart, and see what's going on. Now, here you can see the duster's got these blocks in it, and they slide. And uh, the reason you use the rib cover instead of the smooth is that's the only thing that keeps the secondary sheave from spinning around on this shaft. Without the rib cover, I mean, let's put it on and let you see. I mean, it just it just spins. There's nothing to lock it like on a, you know, like on any other sled, like on any other sled clutch. Something locks that outer sheave. It's called the secondary. It's the movable sheave. Nothing blocks that from turning on this so when you put on the uh ribbed for her pleasure you know you'll note that it's keyed and that's it now with the smooth covers it's only the friction of the pucks and sometimes in extreme circumstances you can make that spin but uh the ribbed 
will not spin on you. It's much more durable. All right, I'm back. So with my duster part, I had an orange spring in there. And uh, I looked up the, the duster calibration guide and all that stuff. I um, also looked at the pucks. These are pretty much the standard pucks. Um, what I decided to do was go to a white spring. Why a white spring? Because I have one. And I know the motor needs to spin higher RPM. So it's just a stiffer spring. So let's get this duster back together. So then you drop in your spring, put on your movable, which that's that's pretty stiff now. That is noticeably stiffer. Then you need to get your 916 bolt started somehow. Hmm. Sure would like to get those flats lined up, but it's hard to see with that washer in there. impact. There you go. So as you can see that covers a pretty good press fit on there and uh, I don't know this thing's good to try. We'll mount her up and see what happens when I run it. I don't know if you caught this but I didn't have the pucks lined up with the ribs when I put it together the first time. And that was actually causing this movable sheave to be pushed in, I don't know, quarter, three-eighths of an inch. So I just blew it apart, lined them up, put it back together. It looked exactly the same, but uh, it's something you got to watch for with the rib dusters. You don't have to watch for it with the smooth cover. So I woke up this morning thinking, hey... That's great, you know, I got this thing lined up side to side, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't check parallelism. So, let me show you how I'm checking parallelism. Say that a bunch fast. Um, you're kind of way up on the tripod, but uh, that's kind of on purpose. So, what I got here is an aluminum rod, and uh, it's contacting the clutch really square here. I just got that rag stuffed in there to hold it. And then, somewhere... I've got my caliper. Where the heck did I leave that? All right, I'm back. I found a caliper. So, all we're going to do is take two measurements where we go by this. And we'll, we'll try not to disturb this aluminum rod too much. But that is like 0.714. And this one is less. And I can, I can visually see that it's way out. This one's like 544. Oh, here's the other caliper I was using that I lost. So, I've taken three of the four motor mount bolts loose. I'm going to take the fourth one loose. And we just tweak it. Just like that. So, now we're going to check that again. Point six one five seven two six. So we're just going to tweak it until we get that thing lined up right. At least I think we will. Hmm. All right. Well, might help if I get that rod held in there better too. All right. Let's check that again. 522. Right there, 522. All right. So there's our parallelism. I should have done that the first time. Now I need that uh, other piece I was using. And we're just going to make sure that the, that the two fixed sheaths line up right exactly when belt width apart. Boy, that's pretty close. It's pretty good, and it's pretty parallel. So I'm going to lock things down right there, and uh, hopefully that gives you a better idea 
on doing your motor alignment on an old sled like this. Let's show you how this goofy drive system goes together. I'm going to kind of point the camera down here and you can see my hand. So here's the belt of choice for the day. It's a 3006 and uh, it's got some arrows on it to tell you which way it goes, which I like. I mean, I know which way it goes. And uh, to get this thing on, well, the first thing you got to do is get the brake rotor out of the caliper and then just get it together. And uh, we'll get it on the uh, primary and secondary later. Let's see, now I got to spread the pads on the disc brake. Pocket knife comes in handy for that. So, it's, you know, it's cold out, it's snowy, and you're doing this on the trail, right? Sure. Why not? Oh, yeah. Look at how nice that thing spins. All right. Step one. Step two, we got to bolt that down tight. Great, just drop that oddball, hard to find, fine thread, 5 sixteenths nut. That'll be great. Where did that thing go? There it is. All right, there's the nut. Since I'm digging around, that's the spacer that lives there. Might as well just go through this window. Alright, now that your hands are all greasy, I guess you just put your belt in with greasy hands on the trail, but I'm going to clean up since I'm in the shop. Alright. Not bad, huh? Now, I need to have a you need to have a buddy with you for this part. I am going to lock this adjustment full forward like this for the next part. Alright, so this piece, it's got some serrations on it. It's got this uh, long end. And uh, I don't know that it matters which way that long end goes, but you do want to get those serrations matched up with something somewhere. There are serrations on the mating piece. Should be a lot easier to get the secondary on now. So I've got to hold the brake still, but I can. So let me get a little vice grip. Oh, look at that! The joys of the joys of figuring out how to do things by yourself. This chain grip vice grip up here—that's the deal. Look at this. Perfect. Secondary opens up nice. Almost like I serviced it really well just a few hundred miles ago. Oh, probably because I did. All right, there we go. So as you can see, the belt's a bit loose. But that's okay. It's adjustable, remember?
There we go. Belt tension is in the ballpark. So next thing, we got to get the chain on because the chain tension and the belt tension interact with each other. You can't do just one. That's a greasy old chain. Chain as loose as it could be. I guess I could take this off. That might actually help at this point. There we go. There we go. That's all I needed to take that gear off. So, there we go. The chain's on. It's just a little tight. It's not horrible. Don't need to go crazy on the adjustment. That's probably pretty good right there. And the belt. The belt could go about there. Guessing that's about right on the belt. Belt tension is purely a guess at this point. the heck is stopping it? Oh, that's what's stopping it. That's just dumb. Not in the chain case. Let me straighten that out just a little, but not too much, because it doesn't need to rub. All right. So we'll try that for belt tension. If it creeps, we'll back it off. It's that simple. Just carry a half inch wrench. I can do that just about anywhere. happy with that. Got one more of those clamp bolts over on the other side. All right, last thing to button up. Last real oddity on this sled is uh, the fact that this bottom sprocket is really only held on by a cotter pin. That's it. And it's not even a very good sized cotter pin. So we will. Do one of these, bend an extra end on it. There we go. Made that look harder than it should have been. The top does get a nut. And the nut gets a cotter pin. And you don't have to go too crazy tightening up the nut. Good enough. All right, that's it. You have now seen all the oddities of the AMF Skedaddler drive system. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying this. It's a lot of fun to work on something that's a little different, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the Skedaddler. Um, my first sled when I was a kid was a Skedaddler. Not very different from this one. And so it's really taken me back. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to driving it. I love riding this sled. This sled's a lot of fun. It's it's pretty light for a steel tunnel sled. It's really easy to throw around. 
I like the way I got the track and the suspension and the and the skis and all that set up on it. Pretty happy with that. This motor with a little more power, that's not going to hurt my feelings at all. So uh, with that said, I'm going to call an end to part three here. And you can be sure there'll be a part four when I finish getting this thing together, hopefully. I'm, I'm pretty close. And uh, take her out for a run. So huge thanks to the patrons. Uh, you guys are the best. Uh, patrons support the channel every month, and in return, they get to watch all the videos early, and sometimes they get some behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, hasn't been any lately because Lonnie and Dennis have both been traveling and just kind of been me in the shop. Hard to do behind-the-scenes on yourself. But uh, anyways, huge thanks to the patrons, and as far as everybody else goes, please hit subscribe and hit the notification bell. Uh, I've got friends that they want to watch the videos, but they don't hit subscribe. They walk up to me and say things like, oh, I guess you haven't put any videos out for a month. Well, no, I've been putting out two a week. I guess you didn't hit subscribe and hit notifications. So uh, go ahead and do that if you want to keep up with these videos with the skedaddler. Um, we'll be back on Lonnie's Gemini before too long. We got Tommy's speedrun sled in the queue. And then we're going to mix it in there with yet another skedaddler, this time uh, the bigger one. So what's that, a Mark V with a, a Hearth 634, I think? Uh, that's my buddy Chad's, and that, that's got a little story behind it there, too. So that's what's coming up on the channel. And, of course, more indies. We're never done with indies. I've got the Ultra. Um, it's just waiting in the wings. But uh, we're just taking a little one longer detour right now. So uh, we'll see you on the trails.